All right, everyone. Well, we can go ahead and get started. My name is Corey Stutes. I'm the museum curator at The Works in Newark, Ohio. And this presentation is based around our current gallery show that's in the um, main gallery at The Works. It's called No Mere Button Pressers, Clarence H. White, Emma Spencer, and the Newark Camera Club. This show is produced in collaboration with the Columbus Museum of Art. I think some of you may be joining me that are CMA patrons who took part in my uh, discussion last week through CMA. So welcome if you are one of those people. Um, if not, I highly, highly recommend you to check out CMA. Um, their show is really wonderful and it's um, sort of a two-part show. So we have half of the show in our gallery and they have the other half. So they have a lot of really wonderful things on exhibit there. Our show um, is also really, really cool. Just a note, we are currently closed to the public at the works, unfortunately, but we will be reopening um, on October 1st. So make sure that you follow us on social media, check out our website, it's www.attheworks.org. You can get all the details on our reopening, what our schedule and ticketing will be like. Uh, so you wanna make sure you do that so that you can get your chance to come in and see the show when it reopens. The gallery is always free to the public, so there's no cost to come in and see the gallery. Uh, so definitely you want to make sure that you do that. Our show will be up through the end of the year, so there's going to be plenty of time to still get a chance to see it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on the presentation. Everyone should be able to see uh, a slide that says no mere button pressers, Clarence H. White, Emma Spencer of the New York Camera Club. Um, so this will be PowerPoint presentation pretty much. Uh, if you're not seeing that, let me know. Hopefully everybody should see that. So this is the man of the hour. This is Clarence White. And Clarence was born in West Carlisle, Ohio in 1871. And from his diaries, we know that he lived a pretty idyllic life, but really enjoyed his childhood there. When he was 16, his father took a job at a wholesale dry goods store in Newark called Fleek and Neal, and they moved to Newark. That would have been 1887. Uh, Clarence actually ended up working there as well as a bookkeeper. We know um, some details from his early life because of his uh, diaries that he wrote. We know that he was pretty artistic. He drew, he played the violin. Um, however, what he's known for is photography. And we know that wasn't a part of his early life because he didn't mention it uh, at all. However, in 1893, he married his wife, Jane Felix, who was a local, uh, from a local family in Newark. And interestingly enough, they got married very early, six o'clock in the morning. And that day, actually left to Chicago to go to uh, the World's Fair in Chicago. It was at the World's Fair in 1893 that Clarence White became introduced or uh, understood the accessibility of photography. There was an exhibit there uh, on photography, and that's what's believed to have sparked his interest in photography because that year is when he actually started taking pictures. So the earliest photos that um, are documented are from 1893. Throughout the 1890s, he uh, continued to be a bookkeeper for Fleek and Neal and had to really scrimp and save in order to be able to take his photos. A few years before that, Kodak had actually come out with their camera that made it much easier um, to take photos. It came preloaded with several exposures and then you could just send the camera off and have it developed, much like uh, anyone who remembers the cameras that we used to have in the days before digital photography. Um, so that was pretty revolutionary in the photography world. However, Clarence White, when he saved up his money, he bought a dry plate camera. So he was still using um, glass plates to take his photos and he developed them using um, the palladium print and platinum printing process, sometimes other processes like he created cyanotypes and other types of photos. This was pretty expensive though, so he had to save up his money. And we learned from uh, one of his students later on that he had said that he would only be able to make two photos per week. So he would think all week what photos he wanted to create on the weekend, because that's all that he could afford to do. He couldn't really afford a home of his own, so he and his wife lived with his family. And this was a this was a pretty pretty big hobby for him. So this this presentation is interspersed with some photos from our gallery. 
So when you can come and visit the works, you'll be able to know where to find which photographers, maybe if you saw something that you liked, you'll be able to go and find it in our gallery. And this will help give some context. So what you're looking at right now is the first wall in our gallery. There is some information about Clarence White, as well as a selection of photos that were taken by him during his time in Newark. He lived in Newark, Ohio until 1906 and took quite a number of photos while he was here during that time. A lot of his photos feature family members, his wife, um, local community members. This is one of his really well-known photos and this is uh, a photo that documents a scene in Newark. This is the scene of the canal that used to run through downtown Newark um, on the corner of 3rd and Canal. And this was actually taken from the vantage point of Fleek and Neal where he worked. Uh, it was taken from one of the upper story windows and we will actually take a look at Fleek and Neal later in the presentation. Um, I'll mention early on, this is sort of a two-part presentation. So you'll get some good information about the camera club, about Clarence White uh, and our gallery show. And then we're going to branch out and we're going to do a virtual walking tour, if you will, uh, to look at some of these sites that are relevant to, to the club. So it's a little bit of an ambitious amount of information to get through in the time. So forgive me if I rush. Please, if you have any questions, let me know um, and I'll be happy to try to address them. So I, I, I don't want to uh, try to get through this too quickly. But back to the photo that we're looking at. Uh, it was taken in 1898 and it documents a scene that was very familiar to Clarence White. Um, most of his photos are of people, but there are some that are of scenes of Newark as well. So it's a really interesting record for us locally because it shows these places that we're familiar with as well today. This is another one, and I really enjoy this photo because it's uh, familiar somehow, and, but yet it's also, we know that it was taken in Newark. It's difficult to identify where exactly it was taken. It's applicable to many different locations, and it's really indicative of his style. It's, it's almost dreamlike, you can tell, sort of um, airy and ethereal. And that's very specific. Clarence White was what's known as a pictorialist photographer. And pictorialists promoted the idea of the photograph as being um, a conveyor of an aesthetic value. So he would actually envision what photos he wanted to take in his mind, much like a painter or someone who was drawing, they would think what they were going to create before creating it, rather than just taking his camera out and documenting whatever was in front of him. He had a very specific idea of what he wanted to create in mind, and then he produced that through the photograph. And, and that's what separated pictorialist photographers from portrait artists. Um, rather than just documenting something for the sake of documenting that information, they were reproducing a concept. This is a really wonderful example of his style because you can see how he uses light um, to create this specific effect the focus is very soft, it almost appears blurry, and that's intentional in order to purvey that dreamlike quality. The cameras of the time took incredibly sharp photos, so this, anytime that you see something like this, it's intentional. It wasn't just a defect of an old camera. Uh, this is him contributing to a specific aesthetic quality that he wanted to produce. And this is a photo of his wife and his two oldest sons in the dining room of their home that was on Hudson Avenue. Um, his photos, I think, really capture the humanity in the subjects because they don't seem overly posed. A lot of them don't. There are definitely some that are, uh, he's going for something specific, but by and large, the photos that he took of his family capture them uh, just living life. And that's, that's uh, not super typical. If you think of a lot of photos that we see around the turn of the century, they're very stiff, very posed, taken in a studio. Uh, you tend to think of those unblinking Victorian photos that are kind of creepy looking almost, and his aren't like that at all. He really utilized the juxtaposition between light and dark as well to, to capture the feeling that he wanted. This photo you can see is called the bubble, and the way that the light streams in through the window and is on the back of her shoulders is in such contrast with the darkness of her dress and everything else. It's a really striking photo. The style that Clarence White was using went against a lot of the traditional 
uh, photography ideals of the time. Many professionals said that he was ignorant of the photographic tradition, that he was uneducated, that he was unqualified. And so they kind of talked down on him as well as other amateur photographers. In fact, the title of the show, No Mere Button Pressers, comes from a derogatory term, button pressers, that referred to amateur photographers using the new Kodak cameras, where you literally just pushed a button and took the picture. Um, Emma Spencer, who we'll talk about in a second, was a member of the camera club, and she wrote an article uh, where she said that the, the members of the club were no mere button pressers. So even though they were amateurs, uh, they were definitely artists in their own right. So when we look at Clarence White's photos, we can see there is definitely a quality, uh, very artistic quality to his photos. They aren't just haphazard. This is probably my favorite Clarence White photo, uh, and it is on display in our gallery, so you can come and see it. It's called Morning, and it depicts his wife. It's a scene somewhere near Newark. We don't know exactly where. I kind of think it looks like Blackhand Gorge, maybe, but it could really be any number of places. The composition is really interesting because the subject is in the bottom right corner, and that tree really cuts through the center of the photo. It kind of flips what the traditional composition rules are upside down, and yet the photo is very balanced, and it's really striking. It draws your attention to not only the scenery, but to the subject. And you notice she's holding that glass bubble. That appears in quite a few of his photos. And it really just uh, contributes to some of the dreamlike characteristics. I just had somebody, um, Dave said that it's definitely a Blackhand Gorge. He found where it was taken. And I feel like uh, I recognize the spot. So that's what led me to believe that it was at Blackhand Gorge. So it's, it's really interesting to kind of connect some of these places together. This is another photo by Clarence White called The Readers. It depicts his sister-in-law, Letitia Felix, and another girl named Ada Follett. Again, you can see his use of light, the juxtaposition between light and dark, very interesting. So in 1898, uh, Clarence had been practicing photography for five years and had really been starting to make a name for himself. He was starting to get published in uh, some journals across the country. He was also starting to have some of his pieces selected to be part of exhibitions. And so he was starting to really get to become a known photographer, even though he was initially ridiculed for being um, ignorant of the rules of photography. When people started to see his photos, they recognized that he was really an artist and that he was pushing some uh, specific aesthetic ideal that he had preconceived in his mind. So he started to become wildly popular um, among not just photographers, but artists in general. So in 1898, he and around 15 other people formed what was called the Newark Camera Club. They were all local uh, people. It was sort of spearheaded by he and Emma Spencer. And I mentioned Emma Spencer earlier as writing the article where the, uh, the name No Mere Button Pressers came from. She was at the time uh, a member of the Monday Talks Club, which is still around. Uh, and she was a prominent member of that club, really well connected in Newark, knew a lot of people. And she would later go on to be a really well-known columnist for the Newark Advocate. She wrote a long running column and a prolific photographer as well. If you look at this, this is a uh, invitation to one of, I have to think it has to be one of the first shows of the Newark Camera Club. They were formed in February of 1898. And this show was in August of 1898 at Emma Spencer's home. And it lists the list of members at that time. It did fluctuate from time to time. So this isn't all the people who were in the, the, the only people in the club. Uh, but if you look, you'll notice some familiar names. We see names like Whirly. We see Edmiston, if anyone remembers Edmiston's bookstore or has heard of it. Um, Emmett Bauer, Metz, Chalmers Pancoast, uh, Wyeth. These are all names that could be familiar to, to um, anyone who's been around New York for any while. The club continued to hold exhibitions like this one that was at the YMCA in downtown Newark. They actually held a few different exhibitions here. And this is a photo of part of that exhibition showing the collection of Clarence White's photographs that were on exhibit. 
according to Emma Spencer and according to the lists of photos that we have that were in those shows, Clarence was definitely the star of the show. He most likely attracted the most attention and sort of brought people to the show who were coming to look at it. On display in our gallery is a uh, brochure that went along with one of these shows at the YMCA. And the list of contributing photographers really is a who's who in the photography world in the early 20th century. There are names like Alfred Stieglitz, Gertrude Kasebier. If you've, if you've ever heard of any of those names, they are kind of considered uh, the grandparents of photography, 20th century photography. Uh, so there really are quite, quite a number of contributing photographers that are on display, but these are photos by Clarence White. I find it really interesting because when you zoom in on the photos, you can see what was on um, exhibit in this picture. And some of the photos are in our gallery and some of them are at CMA. So it's really neat to see that they're, they're still on display. And I had always wondered, uh, because if you notice, they built out sort of a fake wall and it's covered with paper. I assume so that it made it easier to hang all of those photos rather than trying to nail into the plaster walls at, uh, at the YMCA. But I was always con concerned with what color that was. I was just interested. Uh, and I just found an article in the newspaper last week about this show and it said it was light gray. So that's just an interesting side fact. Do with it what you will. I was hoping maybe for a more interesting color than light gray, but at least now I know. So in our gallery, uh, when you come in, you're greeted by this. So here you can see a portion of that uh, brochure that I mentioned that lists the pieces that were on exhibit for one of the shows at the YMCA, as well as the two photos that I just mentioned and some uh, background information about the camera club as well. Emma Spencer was probably the most well-known member of the club aside from Clarence White. She, as I said, was a member of the Monday Talks, which is a very well-known club in Newark. She went on to be a Newark advocate columnist, but she was also a really well-known photographer in her time. She and Clarence were members of what was called the photo secession. And Clarence had helped start the photo secession movement with uh, fellow photographer, Alfred Stieglitz. And that was a group of pictorialist photographers who were promoting the idea. They were seceding from standard photographic values. And they were saying pictorialism is, is uh, it promotes photography as a valid art form. It's an expression of um, a preconceived idea of what we want to create and we're creating it. We're, we are celebrating the aesthetic quality. We um, have all of these values that, that are important to us. And so that's what they were promoting. And so this gave her a lot of uh, connection to other really well-known photographers. And um, I'm sure encouraged her to continue making, making photographs. So this photo, we see this girl in quite a number of her photos. It's her niece, Minette. And this is at the cottage, the family cottage at Buckeye Lake. I enjoy her photos a lot because I think that they clearly uh, demonstrate her pictorialist um, perspective. And you can see the similarity between her and Clarence White in the way that they use light, the way that the focus is a little softer, um, really interesting composition, very natural poses and that kind of thing. Here's another photo by Emma Spencer. And I love this because it's a portrait of three people, yet it's very, it's not your typical portrait. It's not staged in a, in a studio. Clearly, I think they're posed. Um, but the personalities of each person really come through. They're all kind of gazing wistfully. You have the boy in the back looking directly at us you can kind of get a sense of maybe who they were, what their personalities were, where they are in their lives. And it's a really interesting photo. And in our gallery on the back side of that first wall that we saw uh, is a section about Emma Spencer. So you'll know where to go to find her things. Uh, as I mentioned, she wrote an article that was published in a publication called Brush and Pencil, which was um, an arts and crafts uh, publication. And she wrote it about the Newark Camera Club. So a lot of the information that we have uh, comes from her, as well as some photos that, are, that were created by less prolific members of the club. Another member of the club that someone might recognize if they've been around Newark for a while or if they grew up uh, is the name Chalmers Pancoast. In the 1940s and 50s, he wrote local history articles in The Advocate and was well known for that. 
But in the 1890s, he was an amateur photographer. He was the youngest member of the New York Camera Club. He joined the club uh, when it started and he was only 18 years old. This photo of him is from 1896 when he was only 16 and shows him um, in his dark room, which in my mind is probably a corner of his bedroom, uh, his family's home. And it's just a really great photo. This is one of the earlier photos that we have created by him. And it shows a flood in 1898 that damaged a bridge um, in the B&O rail yard. And it's a pretty, uh, it could be a pretty nondescript photo, but I think it's, it's really interesting still, uh, something very geometric about it. And it's one of the very few examples of some of the earlier photos that we actually have of his. This is more typical of a lot of the photos that we see taken by Chalmers Pan Coast. And this was taken to supplement or complement um, one of his articles that was written in The Advocate. So he would take photos of something then, which now is several decades ago for us, uh, but he would compare them to the photos he would do at then and now type thing. And so he would show an old picture of a location and then show the current picture. So a lot of the photos that we have are, went along with things that he was writing. He was a very prolif prolific author. He wrote I think 30 something books, uh, as well as a lot of different articles, both on local history and all sorts of different things. He had a wide um, range of interests and he wrote about all of those. If you'll notice, actually, if I go back, you can kind of see there's some brown um, damage on the side of the photo. And that's because an interesting side note is that several of the albums um, that contain his photos and all, all of the ones that we have are pretty badly damaged by fire and by water. And they were actually at uh, Leader Printing, which was um, one of the older newspapers in Newark. It was the Newark Leader. And they eventually just, they're still around, they do printing. Uh, but they actually had the photos and they suffered a fire on Christmas of 1968. And so a lot of these albums were really damaged by fire, but even more damaged by water. So there is one of the albums on display uh, the pages are very fragile and it's very difficult uh, to release the photo. So a lot of those photos are in there, um, really secure, and some of them are in better shape than others. So we wanted to show some that are still in the album because I opened it to, to a page that shows a couple of his photos from the 1890s. So you definitely want to check that out. It doesn't have too much to do with the camera club, just an interesting side point, but um, cool nonetheless. T.M. Edmiston was another uh, pretty well-known man locally. He owned Edmiston's bookstore that was down, uh, downtown. Uh, it was around for a long time and a lot of people talk about getting school supplies there and uh, different things. He actually uh, sold frames for Clarence Wade, framed his photos. And so they would have known each other probably uh, through that. But Edmiston was also on the board of directors of Park National Bank. He was an elder at Second Presbyterian Church. He was uh, an inaugural member of the Newark Rotary. So he was a, he was a really well-known person locally. And the photo in the center is pretty uh, unique as far as his photos go. You can see a lot of what he took was uh, scenes around downtown Newark. Um, but if I go back to that photo and you see it in the middle, that was a, one of three photos that were taken um, and it was actually chosen to be on exhibit in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, he won an award for it. It was chosen by Alfred Stieglitz. And you can see a lot of influence of Clarence White and the pictorialist movement in this photo, especially when you compare it to some of his others. Uh, but his photos are really great because they're all over the place. They were reproduced largely to be postcards, which were printed in Germany. Many of them were colorized and as you can imagine, if you're colorizing someplace that you've never been, you can get some pretty wild colors on there. So many of his photos actually have written in pencil what colors, uh, certain details on the buildings were, how many postcards he wanted printed. So several scenes from around downtown New York uh, can be seen that way. This is a close up of the photo that was in the center of that display earlier in our gallery. And you can see from the expression on the faces, the composition. Remember that earlier Clarence White photo where the tree went through the center? That sort of broke some rules of photography. And we see this again in Edmiston's photo.
A few years later, in the first decade of the 20th century, um, he took a series of photos of downtown Newark, which, as I said, were reproduced to be postcards. Here you can get a really good idea of the quality of photos that uh, cameras took back then. You know, we think of the antique things being somehow less um, good than the technology that we have now, but they definitely weren't. They, these photos are incredibly clear and really, really great views, both um, just documenting the city, but documenting specific buildings as well. So they're really great for local historians like myself, um, but really interesting. So this was one that was reproduced into a postcard, as you can see, was colorized. Another one uh, that you see a lot, uh, a good hint, you can always find local photos on eBay, a lot of postcards, and you'll see a lot of Edmiston postcards, and you'll see this one specifically quite a bit. This is North Park Place in downtown Newark. Um, a really great kind of vantage point. And it was also produced, or reproduced as a postcard. You can see it was colorized. Um, so it's pretty interesting uh, to see that. And here is a photo of Edmiston. As I said, he was a inaugural member of the Newark Rotary. So here we have two other members of the Newark Camera Club. Uh, Walter Metz and Emmett Bauer, who were also Rotarians, uh, but they were well-known members of the community as well. Uh, Metz's father was president of the Newark Trust, which if anyone is from Newark and they remember uh, the old Newark Trust building, Newark skyscraper downtown, um, he was the president of that. And Emmett Bauer was president of the Home Building Association and was responsible for bringing Lewis Sullivan to Newark to build the Sullivan Building. This is that article that Emma Spencer wrote where we get a lot of the information about some of the camera club members at the time, as well as photos that were taken by them. So there are quite a number of really interesting photos that were taken by camera club members that we don't have many examples otherwise of uh, the photos that they took. She describes that each member sort of had their specialty. Um, Dr. Wyeth enjoyed taking photos of um, animals, uh, we can see Emmett Bauer took kind of portraits. People, people each had their specialty um, that they enjoyed to take. So in our gallery, um, as you come around, this is the kind of the third wall space. We come back to Clarence White. And I mentioned a lot of his photos used his family or used local people. And this is a collection of photos of the Miller family in Newark. The family. Um, commissioned photos a few times throughout the first decade of the 20th century. Many of the photos are of their children, um, other members of the family. So here we have Martha Grace and Virginia Miller, who were uh, two daughters of the family. This is Martha Grace Lang Fleek, who was Alice Miller's mother. Um, and you notice the last name Fleek. So Alice Miller, her maiden name was Fleek. Her brother was Henry Sherwood Fleek and her father was John Fleek. John started uh, what would become known as Fleek and Neal. It had several different name changes through the years as different partners came on. Um, Henry Sherwood Fleek took over and would have been uh, Clarence White's boss at the time that he was working there. And this was John Fleek's wife. So these are uh, people that he, Clarence White would have known from the community, from working for, being neighbors with, which we'll get into in a second. So he was documenting people that he knew, um, taking portraits of, these would have definitely been commissioned portraits, but even as a portrait, his, his style really comes through. You can see how he captures the personality of the subjects. Um, this taking John Fleek Miller, later he went by his middle name Fleek, Dr. Fleek Miller, if anyone remembers that name. And he is just on his tricycle, sort of in his natural habitat which I really appreciate. That sentimentality is really important to Clarence White's work. Uh, this again is a photo of his own family in the dining room of their house. And I love this photo. It's, it's what's known as a cyanotype. So a different type of, uh, uh, different type of developing the photo using different chemicals and it creates this blue color. But this is the, photo, the family in the dining room I love how natural it is. Again, the light creates a very airy, uh, sort of dreamlike. It's hard to really focus on one thing um, type of quality. 
And it just looks like they're just living. Uh, not only was the house where they lived, but it was also Clarence White's studio. So the door to the right actually goes toward the front of the house and it goes into his studio. Um, the dining room is in the back corner of the home. Clarence White, uh, this is a photo of him in 1920, close to the end of his life. He died pretty prematurely in 1925 uh, from a heart attack. He was teaching students in Mexico City, had a heart attack and passed away. Um, and so unfortunately that ended his life uh, pretty, at a pretty young age. However, he had really secured his legacy, uh, not only through his photography in Newark, but because of what he did afterward. He left Newark in 1906 and moved to New York City, where he could be a lot closer to some of his peers in the photography industry. He started teaching classes at Columbia University, and eventually he created his own school called the Clarence White School of Modern Photography that was located in Maine. And he taught a huge number of students and made an impression on so many photographers, both that were his peers and his students. Um, so he was working with the biggest names in photography at the time who continue to be uh, hugely important photographers in the 20th century. One of Clarence White's students was Dorothea Lange, who took what's probably the most famous photo of the 20th century, Migrant Mother. Um, if you're not familiar with that, look it up. You'll definitely recognize it when you see it. She was actually a student of Clarence White's at Columbia University. So he, through teaching and through his photographic style and his um, resistance toward what was the norm, he really impacted photography and changed it forever. And I think because of that, it's pretty safe to call him uh, one of the most influential, if not the most influential figure in photography in the 20th century. So with that, we're going to transition to the tour part of our presentation. So this is a, sort of a high up view. We're gonna imagine we're looking down from the plane. This is downtown Newark as it appears today. I've labeled some places right now and then we'll take sort of a further out view to go to some of these other um, areas. Now, when you visit the show, you'll wanna make sure there is a booklet that goes along with the show and it's available at CMA as well as at the works. It is a really, really beautiful um, publication uh, with some articles that were written by myself, uh, by Anna Lee, who is the curator of photography at CMA, as well as Jordan Spencer, who's a curatorial assistant. It's got so much information, additional photos, uh, as well as a map on the back that points out some specific uh, locations that are relevant to the club. So you want to make sure you get those when you visit either show, either at the works or at CMA. But we're going to kind of dive into some of that now. So if you look, you'll see a variety of locations, uh, but we're going to start toward the bottom where it says Fleek and Neil. If you remember this photo, we saw it earlier. This is Telegraph Poles by Clarence White. And I said that this was taken from the vantage point of Fleek and Neil. And it actually also shows Fleek and Neil. Uh, because Fleek and Neal was originally founded, or I don't know if you use the word founded, but it was established in 1861. And I don't know whether or not it was established in this building, if the building was built yet, or if they built it, or if the building was already built. But regardless, it was established on this site and would have occupied this building, uh, which is at the corner of South Third Street and the Canal in Newark. Uh, in 1880, it actually moved across the street, um, which is where it would have been when Clarence White took the photo as well as when he worked there. Uh, this building is still here. This is what it looks like today, although I think it might have been painted a different color now. I think it's blue. So if you visit Newark, you can still see this building. Unfortunately, the Fleek and Neal location across the street, which looks like this, um, this, is, this is a screen grab from Google Maps, I think from the 2007 view. This is the building that Fleek and Neil occupied later. Um, unfortunately, it has been torn down, so it's no longer there. However, you can still stand there and get the perspective somewhat uh, that Clarence White would have taken that photo from. If we go back to the map, um, I, wanna sh I wanna point out, so you'll notice Smith's gallery, um, photo gallery, things like that. And I wanted to give you an idea of what some of the other photographers in New York were doing. Uh, Clarence was not, he didn't apprentice under any other photographers. He wasn't 
uh, taught by anybody. He was taught by himself and his own imagination. But he would have probably known, at least known of, other photographers in Newark because there were, you couldn't throw a rock without almost hitting a photography studio in downtown Newark. Portraits were uh, coming very popular. Uh, you know, people wanted to get their portrait taken. It was a big deal to get your portrait taken. We didn't carry around phones in our pockets then like we do now. So it was a special thing to get your, your picture taken and it was big business. So there were quite a few uh, photographers around town. This is an ad actually from one of those uh, photographers. Uh, this business kind of did all sorts of things. Haynes Brothers, if anyone's familiar, uh, is a jewelry store. And you can see at the bottom, jewelers and opticians. However, this is an ad for Kodak Brownie uh, camera. This would have been a camera that was used by button pressers. That you just took your pictures, sent it away, and had it developed. Uh, this is a photo actually taken by James Haynes, and he was one of the jewelers, and they were jewelers and opticians, and yet he was also a photographer. So this is an example of uh, one of his photos. He was not a member of the camera club, but just a, another photographer in Newark. But I chose this picture because if you look at the left um, edge of the picture, you can see Smith Art Gallery. So Smith um, refers to a local photographer. Um, his name was Walter Smith, I believe. And then if you see photo gallery kind of in the middle, that one's had me stumped because I've tried, really, really tried to find whose photo gallery that was. This photo was taken in 1902. Um, and in 1899, it was a jewelry store. And in 1905, it was a fruit stand. So I don't know who it was in between. I don't have um, available information for that. Uh, although I feel like it could have possibly been related to James Haynes because the Haynes Brothers Jewelry Store was just down on the other end of the block uh, in this building. This is a photo, again, that we already looked at by Edmiston. And I know that they did have a developing studio here because I found uh, articles that related to that. So it could have been uh, James Haynes. So if you're in downtown Newark, this is what the building looks like now. And the jewelry store was in that middle section. This is that end where the Smith Art Gallery was. Um, Walter Smith was a, another portrait photographer. He had had a gallery in a building that was torn down to make way for these buildings that you see. The very tall one is the Newark Trust, which I mentioned um, Walter Metz's father was the president of. And Walter Metz was a member of the camera club. Um, and I will add, this is a photo taken by T.M. Edmiston. Uh, this one is also on display in our gallery. Edmiston's store actually was the building that's just on the left. Um, so it was inadvertently also a photo of his own uh, bookstore. I think it might have moved around um, a little bit throughout time, but when he was a member of the camera club, that's where it was. This is that view today. Of course, the trust building has been torn down. Uh, the other tall building is still there. Chase Bank in this view. Uh, when they built the trust building, Smith, Smith's art gallery, Smith the artist, had to move to what was called the Franklin Bank, which was a little bit south. And you can see it just on the edge of this picture. You can see the words, the artist. Um, what's cut off is the word Smith, Smith the artist. And in this building, there's a, another picture of it. Not only was he uh, in there, but another photographer, uh, G.W. Chase also had a studio in there. And if you find portrait photos that were taken in Newark, a lot of times you'll see uh, G.W. Chase on them. He was a, he was a pretty well-known photographer. He was also in this building. This is what's there now. That building unfortunately doesn't survive. We had mentioned uh, the YMCA where the exhibitions took place from the camera club. And this is a photo from the same time that they would have been exhibiting there. Um, this is just a little bit north on the corner of uh, 3rd Street and West Church. And it's still there, so you'll wanna check that out as well. You can see some of the buildings we were just looking at just a little bit down um, to give you some perspective. So if you're not from Newark or if you're not very familiar with Newark, all of these buildings that we just looked at are all in the downtown area. You can pretty much see all of them from one vantage point um, if you stand where the courthouse is in the center of the square. So it's pretty easy to find, but of course there is a map on the back of the 
booklet as well that will help you. Another photographer downtown, this is just on the opposite corner from where we were looking. So uh, if I go back to the YMCA, sorry, that was abrupt. Um, just off the right of the screen is this building. And this was uh, the site of two other photographers in downtown Newark. Uh, John McCann, who his daughter Blanche also helped him and she ended up taking over the photography gallery or the photography studio. And O.M. Pausch was another uh, photographer who also occupied this building. Uh, obviously they didn't have the whole building. They had parts of it and other businesses were in there as well. This was the longtime location of Green Bay Fur, if anyone remembers that. Unfortunately, also that building is torn down and this is what's there now. So if you are visiting, this site uh, was also some other photographers. So again, those photographers weren't members of the, photographer, of the Newark Camera Club, uh, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of who else was in Newark. What was Clarence White up against? Who was he uh, working alongside? You could, you know, choose, I guess, to have a traditional portrait. There were many people to take your photo. Or you could go the artistic route and have Clarence White take your photo. If we zoom out a little bit, we can start to see some of the uh, homes by camera club members and some other people that we'll point out. So along the bottom, T.M. Edmiston, he lived on, at, at the time that he was active in the club, he lived on West Church Street. And his address, uh, let's see, was, and excuse me, I'm looking down at my note here to get his address. He was at 235 West Church Street, which the house is still there. Um, this is a picture of that house on West Church Street. He did later move to Hudson Avenue, um, just like us. He moved around and lived in the same house his whole life. Uh, but this was a, uh, the home that he lived in when the club was started and uh, where he lived. Daisy Cherry was another member of the camera club. She was, I think, vice president or something of the club. And she was uh, not a super prolific author, or excuse me, photographer, but she did have one of her photos selected to be on exhibition, I believe in Chicago. Uh, so she was a little bit well known. This is her house on Locust Street, it's located at 153 West Locust, and it is still there. Unfortunately, several of the camera club houses that we were able to locate have been demolished. So this is, <laughs> this was the location, approximate location of Emma Spencer's home at 161 North 4th Street or Mount Vernon Road. Um, as you can see now, it is sort of in between 16 and the on-ramp to 16. Uh, also, the home of Emmett Bauer uh, was in that location as well. If we move north though on Hudson Avenue, there are some houses that we can still see. So on the right in the green box, you can see White family. That was the home of Clarence White. And I mentioned earlier the Miller family whose uh, collection of photos we have um, in our gallery. Those um, we're actually, they're on, just on loan to us right now from the Price family, but they're photos of the Miller family. Um, and then the Fleek family, again, Clarence and his father both worked for Fleek and Neil. I mentioned that the mother-in-law of William Charles Miller was Martha Grace Lang Fleek. You can see they all live very close to each other. So if we think back to Clarence's early life, I mentioned he had a difficult time putting a roof over his head. He liked to live with his family. Uh, but by 1901, he had become successful enough, either through his own virtue or with some support from his father-in-law. Um, there are some, some people that believe either one. Uh, he was able to build a house, and his house was uh, built on Hudson Avenue. Oops, we'll wait for that. Uh, so he was neighbors with the people that he was taking photos with. This was uh, a pretty well-to-do neighborhood, so it gave him a lot of connections. To different people. This is the Miller family home and it's significant because it was designed by Frank Packard who is a well-known Ohio architect, uh, designed several buildings in Newark as well as throughout the state, uh, a lot in Columbus. So this is the, uh, the home of the Miller family. This is how it appears today. It has been added on to, that portion on the left is an addition. Um, 
Frank Packard also designed Clarence White's home, which is the one on the left. It's the yellow home there. Uh, all of these homes are still standing. This is Clarence White's home as it appears today. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy. This is, a, I think, a picture from Google. Uh, so it's a little not super clear, but the house looks pretty much identical to what it looked like when Clarence built it. Oops. Um, so I, I, I want to, I want you to think back to the photos that you saw in the dining room and envision Clarence's work that would have been taking place here in this house. As I said, this was his house and his studio. So the very front right corner was where the studio was, and the dining room was behind that. So this was putting Clarence White in uh, really within easy reach of these people. Um, both the Fleek family that he had worked for took photos of members, the Miller family that he worked for. He also took photos of other prominent families. So a lot of times we'll hear people saying like, oh, I remember he took pictures of, of my great grandma or um, uncle so-and-so or whatever. And so he really was uh, using these local individuals as subjects for his photography, uh, both as a business interest and as, uh, as an artistic outlet. So that uh, does conclude that little tour part of my presentation. There are certainly many more places that you could visit that are uh, in connection to the camera club. Certainly if you were driving around Newark, you'd be able to find it might be a little difficult to walk to all of them because they are spread out a little bit. Um, but there are a few. So I would like to take this time. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, you're welcome to type them in the chat. You can also, uh, you should be able to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you would rather just ask your question that way. Um, but I do, hopefully I see that some people have been typing. It doesn't look like there were too many questions. Hopefully uh, I answered where it was White's house. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and ask. You can type them in the chat uh, below. Or as I said, you should be able to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you would um, rather just ask a question that way. Also, don't be afraid to email me uh, or give me a phone call. As I said, my contact information is on the screen right now. So you're welcome to send me an email if you think of something later, if maybe you have a more detailed question or you're curious, curious about um, a location for one of the other camera club members or something like that. You can always email me. Please feel free to email me or give me a call um, and I will do my best to get back with a satisfactory uh, of an answer as I can. Sometimes questions require a little bit of uh, research, but I don't mind doing that. That's pretty central to my job. So I like that kind of stuff. So feel free to send me an email or something. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, we're just a few minutes before 7.30, so hopefully it gets everybody without having to stick around and listen to me talk for too long. But you can feel free to um, ask a question. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. If you don't have any questions, um, you're welcome to head out. You can leave, leave the chat, but I will keep it open for a couple of minutes um, so that you can ask questions. We do have a couple of people asking, um, where other than CMA can you pick up a catalog? You can pick one up at the works. Um, if you've never been to the works, we are located in downtown Newark. We are at 55 South 1st Street in Newark. Our website is www.attheworks.org and that will give you um, information on where to find us. I believe there are directions on there. Uh, you can give us a call if you're curious as to where we are. Um, so you can get those uh, catalogs either at the works or at CMA. And as I said, they are um, really full of, of a lot of information. Uh, when the works reopens, as I said, the works is unfortunately um, closed to the public right now, but we will be reopening um, October 1st. When we reopen, we will be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and there will be timed slots. So uh, you'll have to get your tickets in advance. You'll be able to choose either um, I believe nine o'clock to noon or one o'clock to four. Um, if you are curious before that though, you can always give us a phone call. We are um, in the office through the week. 
we can answer questions or anything like that. If you have questions, we're just um, currently closed to the public. But when we do reopen October 1st, definitely want to uh, invite you to come see the gallery show. Uh, but check around on our social media, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, because we have been posting um, a lot of content. You'll see uh, things like this, uh, presentations and programs that relate to the gallery, as well as a lot of the other um, works at home uh, programs that we've been doing. So give us a follow on social media if you don't already to stay in the loop on what we're doing. Um, but when we do reopen, as I said, you'll be able to uh, pick a timed slot to visit. And um, all of that information is available on our website. Again, that's at theworks.org, uh, where you can get that, that info. Um, the, this presentation has been uh, recorded, and we will make it available within a few days to the public. So that will be on our Facebook as well. So if you didn't catch maybe the beginning, or you have a friend or family member who wanted to be, um, to wanted to take part but couldn't, uh, it will be available on uh, on our Facebook. Um, Dave, did you have a question? Or I'm not sure if that was a clap or a hand raise. <laughs> Oh, that was a clap. All right, I just wanted to make sure if you had, if you had your hand up or what that was. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, so yeah, so check on our Facebook uh, because the recording of this will be made available. Does anybody else have any other questions? I don't see um, any coming through. Well, I just want to thank everyone for your participation tonight. Thank you for your support of our gallery show. Again, we will reopen to the public on October 1st. In the meantime, go to Columbus Museum of Art and check out their portion of the show. They have a wonderful selection of photos by Clarence White, as well as some photos by Emma Spencer. Um, and so you'll get some background there. You'll be able to see both parts of the show. And uh, then when we reopen, you can come and visit ours. As I said, in the meantime, check out our social media, be on the lookout for the recording of this show and stay in the loop on what we're doing um, at the works. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you later.